And following the CTO, the CEO of Treasure Experience will give us a pitch. Mark is responsible for each of the company's marine-related projects, overseeing all development activities from planning and financing to negotiating contracts. Let's bring Mark Jorine on the stage. Please give him a big hand. So as he said, I'm Mark Jorine. Um, I'm not a teenager anymore. I still feel like one because I get to do the same things that I've wanted to do, do my whole life. So I'm looking around the room. Does anyone ever dreamt of finding treasure? Raise your hands. Don't be shy. All of you have. Maybe it's not sunken treasure. It could be a relationship. It could be a promotion. It could be an experience. But we take the director. We actually spent the last 45 years of our lives, my brother and I, looking for shipwrecks. <clears throat> It's been a rich experience. It's allowed us to travel all over the world. We've worked on Chinese ships in the South China Sea, Spanish galleons in the Caribbean. We've been to North Amer uh, the Arctic in search of gold and in South America. And in this time, we've, we started out as, as crew members and soon we've branched out on our own and we needed to raise capital. So. What I'll do today is address the concerns of potential issuers as well as investors and how it relates to the, how it relates to the STO. So anyone that's ever been in business with a startup or is entertaining it, you already know what this picture is. Those little turtles, about one in a thousand, actually make it to maturity. And it's around the same odds with startups. So, an entrepreneur is a founder, an early stage company. You find yourself underfunded, overworked, and very often you have to branch out and learn things you never thought you needed to know. When I started in this business, I never thought I'd have to write a PPM. And I wouldn't have had to if I hired attorneys, but it would cost many, many thousands of dollars, so I learned how to do it myself. And in our experience, we used the traditional method up until a little less than a year ago. And what that involved was every project started out with our savings. When we ran out of our own money, we borrowed from friends and families or we got them to, family members, or we got them to invest with us. All of this involves financial risk and your credibility is always on the line. So you have to deliver. Once you re reach a certain level, as we did, you find seeking out private equity and angel investors is an appropriate place to go. In the US, we're very well regulated, so you have to produce all the documents and they have to be approved in a form with the, with the um, SEC. <clears throat> and each time you do this, you sell a little piece of your soul until you pay your investors back. And we've done this. We've gone all the way down in and back out many, many times, both in looking for shipwrecks and in developing technologies. The third example I use for, we've never done, but it's one that we've entertained, and it's going over the counter, um, OTC, and that's quite expensive. And it's really not a, as good of an opportunity as the, as the STO. So we, we entertained it, but we haven't done it as of yet. Here's the most important thing right here. When you start a company and you're selling equity, you're selling at the lowest possible valuation. So you're selling off most of what you have for almost nothing. And that determines the next step. Everything you do after that first round is affected by the first round. The direction, unless you can back out and redirect. So consequently, you could sell 50% of your company on the first, first financing. What happens next? You sell one more percent, you lose control. And then if you lose control, all the people you made promises to in the beginning, you no longer can keep your promises. In the US, we used Reg D, and on one occasion, we used a Reg S, and that was only through the introductions to a group of partners in the Philippines. And Reg D and Reg S in the US, we were not allowed to advertise. That means everything was personal introduction or emails to people that you might be interested or going through lead, people who would find leads. And licensed broker dealers usually weren't interested because there wasn't enough money in it for them. 
Excuse me a second, I need a little water. Mike and Chris and I came from Florida, so we're on about 12 hours, 14 hours difference. So all of us were up late last night. In fact, most of the night <laughs> from about one to four. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> another thing when you're a startup company, you have l limited capital. So you, you spend your money to either market your goods and services or you spend it to market your, your financing because you can't spend it twice. I think Klaus covered that earlier. And then the last part is when you, traditional financing, you deal with banks. Now in the US, if a US investor wants to send you money, usually there's no problem. But the minute you go over borders, problems begin. We've had accredited investors, qualified people, multimillionaires try to wire us money from other countries and banks wouldn't send it. So they had to use a different method, which actually in those cases moved to cryptocurrency. Another thing about an impact factor for a company when you start out is not, not very many people know you exist. So here you are trying to sell your goods and services. You're trying to gain investors, but nobody knows you're there. So you, you do what you can to promote your company. All the while, you, you have limited resources, and you also have less time. You divide your time up. And, and for all of us, are we going out today to look for a shipwreck, or are we going to go take calls and make calls to find investors? <clears throat> so all this creates vulnerability. And as long as you're vulnerable, your competition can jump you, either preempt you if you're in technology, they can beat you to the, to the marketplace. If you're in the treasure business and they beat you to the marketplace, you get nothing. Our first expedition is a good example. We arrived in the Dominican Republic, all excited to find this ship. The gunboat came out and said, bye-bye, keep going. Somebody else already found it. They beat us to the punch. Interestingly enough, that company didn't find it. We were offered that contract in August. It's never been found. We were supposed to be there this week, but we decided to come here because this is treasure to us too. So um, I mentioned naked short sellers only because it's always one of the factors that I thought, why would you go over the counter? You're just gonna be like one of those turtles, even if you do have money, because somebody else has more money and they'll crush you. Um, the other thing about the traditional investment, and this is one that we know well, our first projects, somebody would say, here's $50,000, and we would split it. Whatever we found, they got half, we got half. If the numbers got more than 100, we'd pay them their money, and then we'd split the goods. Not, not very liquid business. It's just, you get more stuff. So we have great museum collections, <laughs> the things that we couldn't really sell, and memories from those. <clears throat> Usually the, uh, the most lucrative exit strategies for us have been either the sale of intellectual property or licensing of intellectual property, which our largest transaction to date <clears throat> was 54 million with the company, an oil company in Malaysia. Um, if they had paid us the 54 million, I probably wouldn't be here. But it was still a fun ride. Um, <clears throat> dividends or earnings is another traditional method. And of course, moving on to an exchange like NASDAQ is another method. But short of that, it, I'm always dealing with the investor on a personal level. They give me money, I own a return. They can call me 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week. I don't sleep sometimes. <clears throat> so moving on, why we did, why we made the change. 14 months ago, I didn't know what a digital security token was. I didn't even know anything about cryptocurrency other than that there was something called Bitcoin out there. But when we were introduced to this, we, we, my partners and I spent a few days, well, how would this change our lives? The first thing we noticed was with INX, we had something that was SEC approved. That's, that means a lot, because if you're already in the treasure business, you might be considered a, a crackpot, a nut, a nut job, and there are a lot of them. We know most of them, actually, in the business. Um, but the second thing that got us was the selling the royalty against the cash flow and earnings instead of selling equity. Having 
evolved in business and seen our company, one company we had, we almost lost control over the advice from an attorney who in the first round said, oh, just take this much money, you'll still own plenty. The next, the next round, we would be at 47%. We would lose control. Had we done that, we would have probably been in jail in the US. Um, <clears throat> so it was very attractive for us to be able to say, well, look, all, all small investors really want is to make money. So here's a way to, they can do it. It's more direct to, if we're successful at earnings, you make money. If we're not, you don't. But in the meantime, we don't have to sell pieces of our equity to make deals. The third part that we liked with INX was we had a global reach for the first time. We didn't need personal introductions. That by itself was enough. It was enough for us to say, well, we don't know much about this, as Mike mentioned. We didn't really know, <laughs> but let's try it anyway. Not knowing never stopped us in the past. Um, it's my brother and I invented a uh, submersible robot. We patented it. We, uh, we acquired 10 US and foreign patents. We didn't know how to do that. We did it anyway. So we figured, well, if we could do that, we could do this. We wrote a book, same thing. We never wrote a book before, but uh, by the way, I'll, I'll show you the book at the end. If anybody wants a copy, you just, you just connect with us and we'll send you a, digi a digital copy. <clears throat> the other part that was attractive was we had limited marketing money. And when you're a startup and you talk to marketing people, the first thing they say is, what's your budget? Well, how about zero? I don't really have any money for budget, <laughs> but I'm going to try anyway. So what if you could spend your money to drive people to buy your tokens and your goods and services? Now you're spending the same money twice in a legal manner. <clears throat> the last part, and I mentioned the difficulty sometimes with banks, was if you're already on this exchange, people can purchase through Ethereum or digital, the digital currencies, or they can wire money directly to us. And that was wonderful. I was like, OK, now anybody I know anywhere in the world, if they're in a country that's approved, could do this. <clears throat> but the best part is only token sellers are able to sell the tokens. And I, in the business I've been in, I have seen contracts signed that weren't my signatures, that people owned a percentage of something that I never met. But in this, they can't do it. Um, and it's, by the way, it's fairly common in our business. As, uh, I, w I shouldn't name names, but they're in, news in, in Australia and, and uh, um, the U.S. and parts of the Caribbean and Europe. The other thing that we liked uh, with um, INX specifically was that the platform was open all the time. So as I mentioned before, my investors could call me 24-7. Now, my investors can reach out and do business with the platform. And um, they don't have to call me. All the while, you have a, when you have a, 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 some, a partner like INX, you can build your valuation, and they help you do it. Again, if we had three investors, it's not a lot of work. But if we had 500 investors, we don't have the equipment and the, and the person power to do this. We need help. And, I looked at the cost of them managing distributions, and I realized I couldn't hire somebody to do that. So they help you with the growth of your company and the disbursement of, of dividends and return, and they'll also assist you when people want to cash out. So if you haven't read the INX way uh, and you're interested in this business, I recommend it. I learned a word that I never knew, the insumer, which somebody, somebody in INX coined. It's the investor-consumer. This is the biggest part of our business. Our business is, is, is built on memberships, as Mike mentioned, and a following and brand awareness. So we, we can move into this sector all the while pursuing our goals and objectives with our investors who become consumers or consumers who later can invest. Right now we're in the first round, so if you're in the US, you have to be accredited. And if you're, and if you're a Reg S or outside the US, you don't have to be accredited. However, there's still a holding period, but at some point, we see a segue into 
more of our goods and services available f for token holders and advantages to token holders for those goods and services. I'm going to read this. I think it's important. You don't know who your investors are, and you don't know who your consumers are. I sell a book on, on uh, Amazon. I never know who bought that book. It doesn't, other than the $8 or whatever we get per book, it doesn't do me any good. <clears throat> but if I know who buys my book, I can also go back and ask them if they want anything else from me. It's the same thing with the consumer. They, this is a person who invests and becomes a consumer in your company, and they have a share in your profits. They benefit by, by supporting you. So they, they handle the, your, your growth, and they handle your awareness and your ability to become, in our case, we want to become a recognized world brand. <clears throat> so I, I borrowed this from Bob last week, the gold rush for small businesses and investors. I think the gold rush is a good explanation, but this space right now, this token space, is an adventure. Some of you will find your treasure doing this. And some of you will find an adventure in this as well. Uh, I, for us, that's why we're here. We see this as not only for us, we want as many of you as possible to be issuers. We want this space to fill up with co good companies growing their businesses and bringing more investors. For the early mover like us, you're taking on more risk because there's no handbook, as Mike mentioned. But you can, uh, you can outbeat your competition. And we know who ours is in our business, so we can see them coming. They're behind us. They'll figure it out. They'll follow us. But like Starbucks, we'll have the market share. Or like Microsoft, we'll have the market share because we'll reach that point where they'll just want a little piece, a single, single digit percentage to make their goals. Using the digital token, we have more time. It didn't seem that way in the beginning because we didn't know what to do. But as we've been figuring this out, we realize we have more time to run our business and we're spending less time raising capital. If you asked me today, what would you like to do more than anything? I'd like to take off this suit, I'd like to put on a diving suit, and I'd like to go in the water and find more treasure. I have some somewhere. I just gotta figure out where it is. Too many pockets. So, I'll be happy to show any of this to anybody in person. This is a 16th century Spanish coin. Silver came from Bolivia. It went down on a ship in the Caribbean, didn't make it back to Spain. And this is fun. The first time you pick one up, you're never the same. If it's gold, you're even better. But either way, it's fun. <clears throat> um, so the last part of being an issuer, which didn't dawn on me in the beginning, but it, we evolved to it, is if you have a potential partner, investor, client that says, look, I don't want to be in this digital space, you still can do the conventional financing. You can still write an IOU. You can still sell them a share in a project, and they can have the old, the old fashioned way. You haven't limited that. So you still, you still have the ability to do both. And while I would advise anyone to step into the digital space with us, this particular, is, it's, it's an option. We actually do have some old timers who, they won't change. They're just gonna, it's gonna be the paper or nothing. So for the investors, um, you know investors, I think the best way I can see it is, I'm used to talking to, to angel investors and private equity people. These are people that know that they're going to do their best and nine of the 10 of their investments will not do well. They may fail completely. But that one out of 10 can get them 100x. So the average investor with a few thousand dollars cannot play in that game. They're, you don't have the negotiating power. You can't turn a company in a direction and make them do whatever you want for $5,000 or $10,000. But in this market, you can. In this market, you can play for the 100x. You can have 10 investments, nine can, just like the formula, do your, do your due diligence, nine out of 10 will fall down and they won't make very much money, but the one that does can make you the 100x. So now you can be a big player with a relatively small amount of money. 
also with this exit strategies. For us, it was always, the exit strategy was both the most exciting part of our business and sometimes the most painful. Because when people exited with less than they got it, came in, it didn't feel very good. But when they could make multiple times their money back, it was great. Well, now we have exit strategies with the, the token that it, investors can come and go. They don't have to talk to us. They can stay for the next round of distributions or they can sell it at a profit at their discretion. And there won't be any weight on us for that. So we still have the fun of paying out our investors and we don't have to deal with the disappointment. Um, and then the last thing is you can just invest, as an investor you can ch choose the return on investment that suits you. So in our space, if you were talking to me, by the way, if anyone's interested, it's becoming an issuer. We're, in the, we're still learning, but we'll share everything we can with you. Unless you're a treasure hunter, then we may not. But as far as the, the type of companies, the companies that want to build a community, people that really feel like their, their consumers will invest and their investors will become consumers, members, anything that involves brand awareness, this is a perfect opportunity. It may not be, at least in this space, the best place for somebody to go into oil and gas exploration. It might be, I just don't know for sure. But the, the kind of business this is, is if you're building a community, this is perfect. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the investor is both the consumer and the, and the customer. Oh, I'm, I'm backing up here. Okay, I'm sorry, I went the wrong direction. So next steps, you have to do your due diligence. If you're, an, if you're a, a potential issuer, find the right platform for you. INX was perfect for us, we love them, they're great. They, we've never been more than a few minutes in, in wondering what to do next. We reach out to them, they get back to us immediately. We misunderstand something, they clear it up. So we're very, very happy with them. But if you're in another space, another country, INX may not be your best choice, but make sure you're talking to people that aren't like, well, I did have one approach me that looked an awful lot like Sam, Sam Bankman Freed in a bathrobe and all the same hair at midnight. <laughs> I told him, no, I'm not interested. He wanted us to migrate to his exchange, which I'm not sure even exists. Uh, communication, Mike mentioned it. Communication is the key. We, we started out with, well, hey, we'll launch this offering. Fizzle, fizzle, a few dollars came in. Well, this is interesting. What do we do? It was like three months before we figured, we maybe better email these guys and tell them we're alive. And pretty soon, just the Telegram channel and email communications, and anybody that was in the early round, we sent them a musket ball. We sent them a musket ball, they put more money in. So what a wonderful place to be. And we have more musket balls too, if anybody's interested. <clears throat> um, but each, whether you're an issue or, or a um, potential investor, choose what's right for you. This is the greatest opportunity that I've seen in my lifetime. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm not a teenager. So if you want more, reach out to us. Mike and I will produce a, a PDF in the next few weeks. We'll put a space on the website that mentions the Security Token Summit and our activities, inviting any of you at all. Have any questions? If we can help you, we'd love to help you. And in that, I'll say thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your heartbeats and breaths with me and your country. I appreciate it very much.